Today, I want to talk about the topic, how to make Jesus Lord and Jesus King of our families. God's intent is that he would lavish his unfailing love and his grace to a thousand generations of those who love him. Exodus chapter 20, verse 26, shares that. That God wants to lavish this grace to the thousandth generation. That is a very long time. That is a very long blessing. And that is God's intent. His will and his purpose is to send that blessing through the generations. And I love that word to lavish. God is not wanting to give you just a little blessing here and there. He wants to pour it out in abundance. The word lavish has the image of an absolute downpour of rain. You know, here in Kailua Kona, in Hawaii, we have a tropical environment. And in the tropics, you know, sometimes you can get an absolute deluge of rain. And when I park my car in the garage, it's only about 15 feet to the front door of my house. But running from the driver's seat in my car over to the front door, I can get completely drenched uh, with water just in running those couple of steps. That is what it means to lavish. And God wants to lavish you and your family with that blessing. Jesus says it in a different way. In John chapter 10, he talks about how he is the good shepherd and that he has come so that he would be able to give those who follow him in the New Living Translation a rich and satisfying life. And in another translation, in the NIV, it says, life abundant. It's that same concept of to lavish or abundantly pour out blessing. That's God's intent. And he wants to pour out that blessing in all aspects of your life and our lives. Now, this abundant life that Jesus wants us to have personally, but also in the context of our families, is key and vital that we understand what the goal is. Now, can any one family deliver that perfectly all the time? Well, not really. But if we have that goal, we can pursue it, knowing from Exodus chapter 20, verse 6, that it is God's intent that that blessing goes to 1,000 generations. How is this possible? How can we actually live in such a way that we can share this blessing from one generation to the next? Firstly, I believe that it is incumbent on the parents, on mom and dad, on husband and wife, to resonate this kind of abundant life in their relationship. And that's a tall order. Now, I've been married for almost 20 years. We have three children uh, in our family. We also have three children in heaven. That has been a difficult journey for us. And maybe I'll share that a little bit later in this message. However, we have gone through the challenges of life also. And, you know, beyond the normal um, challenges of just husband and wife, of man and woman coming together, we think so differently, don't we? But the goal is, how can we live in that abundant life? in all categories of life. And friends, this is a spiritual goal. This is God's will for us to live with this quality of life. It's a spiritual imperative that we understand that this is vital. Husband and wife must experience 
that kind of level of unity? And how can we do that? We must work for it. We must fight for it. We must do everything that we can to make that a reality. One of the things that we have done is that we have actually gotten counsel, marriage counseling. Now, that is not an admission that you're failing in your marriage. It's actually an indication that you want to grow. And so recently, my wife and I went through this experience, and it was so good. We learned and we grew so much just by being able to listen to how the other person experienced this life and our relationship, and we can grow. But the deepest thing that I learned from this time was about prayer. How can our prayer lives enable unity of husband and wife? Our counselor asked me to read a book. And would I read a book about contemplative prayer or quiet prayer? Prayer, which is not so much an activity, but it is a state of heart. The Apostle Paul talks about how we should be praying at all times. How can we have that quality of prayer? And so we were challenged to be able to interact with God on that level. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that my mind is always active. I have so many ideas, so many thoughts, so many things are racing through my mind. And it's, it's difficult to still that. But this book and this counselor taught us that we should become quiet before God and rest in his presence. And you know what? It worked. All of a sudden, I could experience the presence of God. So real and so genuine and so personal. It just simply happened. And as my wife and I embarked on this journey, 20 minutes a day of quiet prayer, you know what began to happen? We began to be able to bring those things that were challenging to us, those things that were difficult to us, those things that were frustrating or discouraging or that brought sort of disillusion into our lives. And as we are at that point of prayer, we can bring them to Christ. And you know what? He is so good that he can transform it from difficulty to his grace. And folks, even our sin. God knows all of the things that we struggle with. Bring it to him and ask him to transform it into his salvation. And you know what? He will. Secondly, the thing that I have learned is to be able to bless our children. As parents, if we are living in that quality of abundant life that God has for us, we need to articulate and speak out blessings on our children. How will our children know that they are blessed of God if they don't hear it from the two people that matter most in their lives, their father and their mother. In Numbers chapter uh, 6, verse 24 to 26, we have the high priestly pr prayer. And, and Aaron was to speak this prayer out over the people. And it's very important that he speaks that out so that the people of God will know that they are blessed. A teacher came to our YWAM base here in YWAM Kona, and he was speaking and teaching us about the importance of blessing. And so my wife and I from that day decided that we were going to bless our children. And so since then, every night, we have taken our hand, laid it on our children, and physical touch is important laid our hand on our children, and blessed them. And not just a vague prayer, but a blessing. I bless you, my beloved daughter, 
that you would know that you are have a, a purpose and an identity, that God has made you wonderful, that you have a plan, has a plan and a purpose for your life to speak blessing into them. And that blessing provides a strong spiritual foundation that they can live from and grow from. And, you know, we started to do that about 10 years ago. And our children know that they are blessed. But not only that, they also now bless other people because they know that they are also blessed so that they can live in the reality of that blessing. There was one night I came home, it was about midnight, and I flopped into bed. We had just had a long meeting at our YWAM center, long leadership meeting. I was exhausted, and I fell over exhausted into my bed. All of a sudden, I felt a presence next to me, and it was my daughter, Elisa. And I woke up with a shock. I said, Elisa, what's wrong? And she said, Daddy, you didn't bless me last night. And I said, oh, baby, I bless you in Jesus' name. Now go to sleep. She needs to hear that blessing. Your children need to hear that blessing. So I want to encourage you tonight, take your hand, sit with your children, speak blessing over them, and they will know that they are blessed from the most important people in their lives, their mother and their father. Thirdly, and also importantly, it is vital to pass on the word of God to the next generation. It's vital that we pass on the reality of God to our children through the Word of God. This is a topic that I could speak on at length, but I will limit myself this morning to just a couple short comments. Live a vibrant life in the Word of God. Nothing can replace that. About 10 years ago also, the Lord challenged me to learn the whole New Testament by heart. And I thought to myself, Lord, really, can, can this be you? Is that even possible? And, uh, but the Lord didn't say anything more. He just challenged me. I want you to learn the New Testament by heart. And so after that, I thought, well, if God is speaking, I'm to do that. And so I began to do that. And I would get up at 3.50 a.m. You know, I'm also very busy. My days are com and nights are completely full. Where could I find time to do that? Well, I knew it was 3.50 a.m. So every morning I set my alarm the, it, to vibrate and it vibrated and it woke up my wife. She was so unhappy with me. She said, Paul, God told you to do this and not me, and this is your thing, and every morning you wake me up at 3.50 a.m. In any case, every morning I would wake up at 4 a.m. to spend two hours in God's Word, to learn God's Word by heart. And you know what? Something very interesting happened. My son was about five years old at the time. He came, and I would hear the patter of feet in our little condo, and he came, and he would sit on the couch, and he would just simply listen. It was so off-putting. I said, this is my special holy time with God. And I have this little human being sitting there listening to my every word. I, I felt so like vulnerable. But I felt like the Lord say, Paul, simply let him sit there. Let him do that. And so I did. And every morning he came and sat and listened to me. Try to learn God's word by heart. Because I would do it spoken word. And you know what happened? God's word was becoming alive in his mind. His five-year-old mind. And it's been such a fun journey. A couple of years later, I was learning the gospel of John by heart. And we were learning about how Jesus turned the water into wine. And... Uh, later that day, we were at the beach here in Hawaii, and he was simply standing on the beach, staring out to the horizon, to the Pacific Ocean. And this was not normal. He's normally very active, very dynamic, always moving. 
And I thought, well, what's going on here? So I, I went next to him and I stared out to the horizon. And do you know what I saw? Nothing. I could see absolutely nothing. And eventually I said to him, I said, Levi, what are you staring at? He said, oh, daddy, I asked Jesus to turn the water into wine. And he was waiting for the whole Pacific Ocean to turn into wine. And, and it was such joy and such delight at us sharing fellowship in these scenarios and situations. But I share that to demonstrate how the word of God was coming alive in his mind and in his own heart. And it created a hunger for God's word in his heart. So all by himself, he decided that he would read the whole Bible from beginning to end when he was about eight or nine years old. He decided then later he would learn the Gospel of Matthew by heart. And the Word of God has become the foundation of our family life. While we're together, virtually no day goes together where we don't sit down, read God's Word, discuss God's Word, integrate it into our lives and also share about the things of our lives with one another. Make the word of God the center of your family life. If we do this, we can be shining lights in our community to other families. And friends, the family unit is under significant impact in our world today. We can be statements of the kingdom of God. You see, the kingdom of God is not only to be lived out in the context of the church structure. It's also to be lived out in the reality of family life, where the Lord wants to bless us to 1,000 generations. To find a marriage partner, there is so much brokenness around the family unit. Now is the time for us, as the people of God, to shine like the stars in the firmament. Do whatever needs to be done to make this a priority in our lives. And we will see his kingdom come and his will be done on earth and in our families as it is in heaven.